I'm Gareth Westwood, Head of Global Intelligence at Sibline, and I'm delighted today to be joined by our lead analyst on the America's desk and my co-host for today, Sydney Stewart. Sydney, welcome. Hi, Gareth. Well, great to see you back on the podcast. Um, we've got a very, very busy show today. Um, and I'm, I'm going to stick to my promise. I'm not going to list 25 things that we're never going to speak about and just only speak about three. So we do have three or four issues we're going to chat about. However, before uh, we get into that, um, we've, we just did a great interview with Edie Lipton from our um, uh, Sub-Saharan African team on our mm-hmm. MIA desk on the recent coup in Gabon. Seems to be a coup every week um, in that part of the world. So really good interview. I wasn't quite sure what on earth was going on when it kicked off. Edie's put me in the picture, so do stick around for that. And later on, we do have a very short update uh, from our Eurasia team on Armenia and Azerbaijan. So do stick around. But um, let's start as we mean to go on. Uh, And the first story today is actually North Korea. Uh, You know, an ongoing issue that we we regularly report on here at Sibline, uh, but I don't think we've actually spoke about it on the pod before. So um, you wanted to talk about its simulated scorched earth nuclear uh, strike drills that um, that took place what, on the 31st of August, I think. So yeah. tell us a bit about that. Sydney. Well, uh, as North Korea is known to do, they simulated a full-scale uh, nuclear uh, attack simulation against South Korea, as you indicated. Um, this was timed with the U.S.-South Korea um, Ulchi Freedom Shield military exercise, um, which, uh, as I understand, is an annual uh, annual drill. And during the joint military exercises, um, the U.S. deployed its uh, B-1B uh, strategic uh, nuclear bombers to South Korea, something that happens very regularly. Um, this was apparently the tenth time that they have deployed this aircraft um, to the Korean Peninsula in the in the last year. Um, but again, is just a you know a, a, a perennial point of contention that you know serves as a trigger for uh, further nuclear strike drills. And of course, it's, it, you say it's the tenth time what a B one has been deployed, or well, the tenth time that a strategic bomber has been deployed. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, not not unusual for North Korea, but this was. Uh, particularly uh, large test, I think, which is why we reported on it um, last week as we're recording this on Monday the 4th. Um, So as a result, um, our uh, APAC desk put out the fact that uh, North Korea was then sanctioned, I believe. Mm -hmm. Um, By South Korea and Japan simultaneously. Yeah, unilateral sanctions uh, sanctions, um, on entities and individuals supporting the the, the missile program. Um, and on the same day, uh, the commander of the U.S. Strategic Command arrived in Japan, uh, as we as we talked about. So, um, I mean, it's quite quite evocative, scorched earth nuclear strike drills. But you were speaking to our desks. Um, nothing too much to worry about. Nothing nothing changed really. The assessment remains the same. Tensions in the region remain very high, especially amid you know increased uh, military and diplomatic relations between. Um, Japan, South Korea, and the U.S. Mm. So with that increased cooperation and attention paid uh, to the Korean Peninsula, you see continued, uh, you know, fiery rhetoric from North Korea, but the risk of war remains low, as does the prospect of uh, business disruption. Well, as you say, no change, but we do keep an eye on North Korea uh, with uh, regularity, and maybe we'll speak a bit more to our desks about it on the, on the next podcast. But let's move on, uh, but stay um, in the APAC region. Um, Australia, um, power supply concerns um, due to the uh, El Nino uh, phenomenon, which we did actually report on back in July. Uh, there's a report here that... Um, uh, the Australian energy market operator warned that there would be an elevated risk of outages uh, in, in Victoria uh, and South Australia um, over over December and into February, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, yet quite worrying for businesses uh, operating in the area. You've been speaking to the desk again. Um, what insight do they have on it? Well, this is rather novel. Um, the El Nino weather phenomenon is going to you know, increase the likelihood of hotter and drier periods, which will then in turn increase demand for um, for power generation, for things like air conditioning, and so people can um, hopefully stay in a cool climate um, despite the punishing temperatures outside. Um, this paired with, you know, general market demand for, for energy, both for commercial purposes and residential uses, um, is going to drive up that overall energy demand 
Meanwhile, Australia has committed to um, significant reductions in its reliance on um, coal-powered mm. uh, or coal-generated um, power yeah. overall. Um, specifically, they have committed to uh, shuttering two-thirds of their um, aging coal-generated power capacity. Um, currently, Australia is highly reliant on, on coal-powered um, uh, energy. Uh, and these renewables, though, they, you know, it, they're unlikely to um, mitigate what could be outages this time around, right? December to February. Indeed. I mean, you know, it's going to be in the medium to long term that Australia is able to effectively implement renewable alternatives, but there's a serious, you know, short term, short to medium term gap in their power generation capacity. Uh, uh, worrying times indeed, um, you know, for business continuity and, and resilience uh, in Southern Australia. Um, but let this not stop us from shamelessly plugging our new product uh, that's coming out as we record this in a few weeks towards the end of September, our Climate Quarterly, uh, where uh, you and uh, a collaboration across the desks will be uh, looking at outcomes of uh, climate driven extreme weather etc uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about that report yeah absolutely so our first edition of the climate quarterly will uh, examine heat stress as a general theme and there will be two chapters one on wildfires and one on drought so the report will include um, case studies in, in every region of the world um, examining the specificities of uh, impacts that heat stress has for business uh, continuity and uh, socioeconomic risks. Because of course this, this year we've seen, um, yeah this year alone we've seen multiple examples of how heat stress has um, you know, caused significant disruption for individuals and businesses as well as you know, some tragic outcomes, not least the wildfires of course in your part of the world um, in, in, in Canada. Yes, uh, wildfires continue to rage in Canada and as well uh, unfortunately we've had uh, a massive uptick in uh, large wildfires in uh, Northern California and the Pacific Northwest yeah, as, as well. As well as of course some holiday venues in, in Europe are we, as, as we've seen. Yes, absolutely and of course the you know, the fires in Greece, as well as the fires in Maui. Um, these uh, are cases that we will in examine in the climate quarterly, uh, the impact on tourism and uh, local, local economic impacts. Excellent, can't wait for that to come out. But in the meantime, um, Australia, you know, real challenges there. So um, I'd ask any of our friends, colleagues, clients and listeners, do reach out to us if you want any more information on that and we'll continue to monitor it. Absolutely. But now let's come over to Europe. Um, Finland, we've been looking at uh, you know, extreme left and right wing activism and extremism um, in Europe and North America as recently as our last edition of our extremism quarterly. Yeah, correct. Um, in Finland, um, on the 31st of August, prosecutors filed charges against four individuals, Finnish individuals, suspected of plotting attacks against migrants uh, and actually political opposition parties as well. Um, now, it's an emerging trend. Um, you know, as we've covered, but what is more worrying, what I saw from the report that we wrote on this um, just last week, was the growing trend of 3D printed weaponry, mm -hmm. which is, um, you know, really, really quite frightening. So what happened here? Um, what exactly were these folks planning to do? Do we know? They were suspected of carrying out attacks um, potentially against uh, migrant communities, as you indicated in the political opposition. So these folks, luckily enough, didn't manage to pull anything off. Um, but what exactly were they accused of planning to do? So in addition to uh, reportedly plotting attacks against migrants and the political opposition, they also were suspected of attacking, plotting to attack um, critical infrastructure, including railways and uh, energy infrastructure. So really we see, you know, a broad range of threats uh, emanating from this, these far right extremists in Finland. Um, and they also reflect trends that we've seen across Europe as well. And I was going to say, uh, across the pond as well, right? Because we recently talked about uh, far right extremism impacting um, infrastructure in North America. Right? Is, it, it, is this got a similar flavour to it? Yeah, certainly. It seems it seems that way. Um, in the U.S., uh, groups have been plotting um, attacks against uh, su electricity substations um, and have, in fact, actually carried out such plots on multiple occasions. Um, moreover, uh, there have been uh, members of American far right groups that have circulated manuals instructing individuals how to carry out such attacks against electricity infrastructure. Um, these manuals are found on far right Australian telegram channels. So, indeed, we're seeing you know a dispersal of the you know 
techniques, tactics, and procedures necessary. Oh, so a proliferation of this sort of attack. And just to remind me, Sydney, because I'm at a bit of a loss here, why the electricity grid? Well, an attack against the electricity grid would bring about, um, you know, tremendous chaos if somebody was to be able to, you know, pull off a major uh, attack against electricity infrastructure. And there's a particular ideological element where far-right groups seek to bring about basically the end days of, you know, the present government and present society called oh. accelerationism. Well, well, there you go. So much for anarchists being on the left wing, a coalescing of uh, ideologies here. Um, but yeah, really worrying risk. I mean, you know, the intelligence and security services are, looks like they are quickly catching up to this threat, just like, you know, in the early 2000s, we had to do with the jihadi threat. Um, but as I think, you know, 3D weaponry, um, it's, it's an increased capability and a worrying one because it's, it's seemingly so simple and potentially undetectable. So we'll keep an eye on that. I know uh, Ben from our um, Europe desk really, uh, and Tom actually really kind of um, on this. And as I said, we have recently uh, compiled an extremism and quarterly which deals in depth with, with this. So again, any of our listeners, um, friends, colleagues, and clients wish to have a look at that, um, we, can, we can email that across. But I think that's almost um, all we've got time for. However, we have, of course, the World Cup coming up, the real World Cup, which is the Rugby World Cup, <laughs> as opposed to that round ball game that I hear so much about. Um, and as we're recording this, this is, of course, um, it's coming up this Friday. I suspect it'll be imminently upon us by the time we get this podcast out. But uh, we've recently done um, a risk assessment uh, for, the, for the World Cup because, of course, it's been held in France and France has been no stranger to threats this year. Indeed. I mean, it's a particularly unique event in that, um, you know, the World Cup will take place in an array of cities across France and at a time when the country has been plagued by serious, serious bouts of domestic unrest throughout the summer season, as well as a series of um, disruptive protests by environmental activist groups. Um, and as well, we've seen a kind of global or transnational trend in environmental activist groups targeting um, international sporting events. Yep. Uh, we, saw, we saw Just Stop Oil protesters uh, target the rugby union at Twickenham uh, back in May, um, as well as uh, groups have targeted the Tour de France and the French Open. So. Of course, the snooker as well. The list goes on. Yeah. Um, yeah, just reading it here, quite a big... Um, quite a big forecast section on uh, domestic unrest, activism, etc. Um, and of course, the crowd control measures that were lacking during the Champions League um, match that was, that was again, quite uh, heavily covered. Um, France also no stranger, especially the population centres, to uh, you know, criminality. And our, again, our Europe desk has done a great job here in passing out some of the more common tricks and tactics. So again, uh, anybody who wishes to catch up on that and uh, get a copy maybe you're going to france maybe you're going to um see um see some of the some of the matches um please do get in touch and we'd be only too happy to uh, provide you a copy of the event risk assessment era i do believe we've released it out on social media as well haven't we i think we put that yes. out on linkedin yeah i do believe so so um anybody who's registered for the webinar can get a copy but again anybody who wishes to have a copy please just get in touch however we do have a quick update i believe that karana sent you from our um europe and eurasia desk on um Armenia and azerbaijan so let's have a listen to that shall we on the 1st of september armenia's ministry of defense reported that Four of its servicemen were killed by an Azerbaijani shelling in Sot, located near the border with Azerbaijan. Meanwhile, Azerbaijan's Ministry of Defense reported that Armenia struck positions in the Kalabajar region. According to Azerbaijani authorities, three servicemen were injured as a result of the alleged strike. The incident comes after the Russian Ministry of Defense reported on the 29th of August a violation of the 2020 ceasefire agreement by Azerbaijani forces in Nagorno-Karabakh. No casualties were reported. While such violations are common, this is the first time the Russian peacekeeping force attributed a violation of the ceasefire to either side since November 2022. These incidents clearly underscore the increasingly volatile security environment in the Armenia-Azerbaijan border and in Nagorno-Karabakh. Further clashes between Armenian and Azerbaijani forces will raise escalatory risks in the coming weeks. 
ultimately security incidents in the border region will complicate the negotiations over Nagorno-Karabakh, where the humanitarian situation remains critical due to the ongoing blockade of the Lachin Corridor. Well, thank you, Karan. And of course, whilst the world is continues to uh, have its BDI on Ukraine and Russia, uh, a, a very important regional conflict, um, you know, with with wider implications um, in, in in that part of the world. So again, uh, our Eurasia team do a great job of, of monitoring that. And thanks again, Karan. However, that is definitely it for now. Sydney, we have to do this interview, otherwise we'll run out of time. So thank you so much for joining me on the pod. It's been a great pleasure and I can't wait to see you the next time. Pleasure as always. Thank you, Gareth. In the early hours of 30th of August, gunfire was heard at approximately 6.45 local time in Gabon's capital, Libreville. Indeed, from a very, very early stage, it did seem like we were on the precipice of another coup in West Africa. Ultimately, a very short time after, a small cadre of law enforcement and military personnel did indeed announce the dissolution of President Bongo's government from the presidential palace in Gabon's capital. Well, to unpack this further, I'm delighted to be joined by Edie Lipson, who is an analyst on our uh, Middle East and Africa desk, uh, specifically covering the Sub-Saharan Africa region. Edie, welcome. It's wonderful you join us. Thank you. Uh, another coup. You've been quite busy, haven't you, in the last couple of months? We have. Um, so, come on, um, what exactly happened uh, this time around? I know a lot of our listeners uh, and friends and colleagues will be familiar with it, but for those who aren't, how did this pan out in the very early stages? So on the 26th of August, we had a general election in Gabon. Um, and shortly before the coup actually happened, the Electoral Committee announced that President Bongo had won the election. Um, the opposition rejected those results. Um, they claimed electoral victory. Um, and then on the 29th of August, as you say, we heard gunfire in Libreville. And then the 30th of August, um, a group of um, presidential guards, military and police calling themselves the um, Committee for the Transition and Restoration of Institutions or the CTRI announced that they had dissolved the government of President Bongo. So um, President Bongo then he uh, similarly to um, other recent coups uh, has been placed under house arrest? He has yeah. And um, what's happened to the institutions uh, of government? Are they still functioning? Uh, are any parts of the government still functioning? So they've completely dissolved all institutions at the moment. Um, we had the inaugural address of um, the new transitional leader, General Nguema, um, this morning, actually. Um, so he has announced that he will be holding a constitutional refer referendum. Um, he also announced that uh, they were going to release political prisoners, um, bring some people back from exile as well. Um, but in terms of a transition back to civilian rule, we haven't heard anything on that yet. OK, so a load of implications I want to go through. But before we do, um, many listeners, um, colleagues and friends will be drawing quite strong parallels with what we've seen in other West African nations uh, over the last few months. How is this? Is it different? And if so, how? I think there is some sense that um, this was kind of uh, prompted by successful coups elsewhere in the region, um, kind of probably seeing it as, well, they can do this and it worked, so we can do this as well. But they are very different. Um, so we haven't seen in Gabon um, the this group, the CTRI, rely on um, anti-French sentiment or rely on nationalistic ideology or anything like that um, because in itself um, this long-standing discontent with President Bongo's government seems to be enough really to kind of drive support for the coup itself. So, so, so qu quite different in, in, in the motivations then mm -hmm. um, and the ideology behind it, yeah. purely domestic political reasoning mm -hmm. one assumes. Um, what has the regional reaction been um, from the likes of neighbouring countries, for example, um, and, you know, kind of multinational institutions? So the Africa Union suspended Gabon, um, Gabon's membership um, quite, quite soon after the coup happened. But we've seen um, countries like the US and France call for a return back to civilian rule. Um, but unlike uh, 
with Niger, for example, they haven't actually called for Bongo to be reinstated. Um, so in Niger, we did see them call for Bazoum to be reinstated. Um, and that in itself kind of indicates that this is it's a different kind of coup. It's um, more kind of centred on um, overturning uh, a regime that they weren't able to with elections that were um, supposedly rigged. Okay, so I mean, we, we could probably go into the the whys and the hows um, over Gabon's kind of electoral system, which I'm sure we would both find very fascinating. But um, I think our listeners and viewers probably want us to go into the implications. Um, uh, yeah. So, as in other coups, you reported. I mean, the report was last week, now wasn't it? But the the borders, Gabon's borders, were closed yeah. at time of recording, the fourth. Are they still closed and are they likely to remain so in the near future? They reopened over the weekend, um, so there's a full uh, cross-border movement happening there. Okay, so um, trade not that affected then, um, yeah. although obviously there would have been uh, quite quite an acute impact in the, in, in the days following the, um, following the, the coup. And, and Edie, um, just a bit more on the context of this um, before we go to the implications. Um, the, the the chap that's dissolved Bongo's government is actually related to him, right? He is. He is his cousin. Okay, so um, the fact that he's related then, does that colour your assessment as to whether there's any intention actually of rever reverting back to a civilian government? Um, so the leader of the opposition did call it a family affair, he called it a palace revolution. Um, it explains why the son of President Bongo's associates are being targeted at the moment. And I think if it is a palace revolution, it does reduce the likelihood of a swift transition to civilian rule. OK, so on implications then, have we seen um, unrest, violence in Libreville or has this gone largely peacefully? It seems to be peaceful so far. Um, so right after the coup, we saw celebrations in Libreville um, and other cities as well, like Port Gentile. Um, but in saying that, there is a risk that um, the longer the transitional government put off announcing any um, kind of intention to return back to civilian rule, uh, this is likely to kind of escalate tensions with the opposition, which are already mm. high. Um, at the moment. So uh, during the inauguration speech today, um, General Nguema said that he uh, would annul the election results and this rejects what the Opposition Alliance um, Alternance 23 asked for last week. So they asked for the elections to be concluded. Mm. They see themselves as the um, the rightful successors to Bongo's government. So the fact that these elections have been annulled now um, it's likely to escalate those tensions and that in itself kind of um, increases the risk of unrest. Sure, um, I mean, and we see here as well, um, you know, that you say that the institutions have been taken over or dissolved, mm -hmm. actually. Um, so the longer that takes place, the longer social security impacts or, you know, trash removal or whatever, the, you know, the infrastructure of society is affected. I, I assume there will be public unrest if that was to continue in the long term, right? Yeah, definitely. But at the moment, it does seem like business as usual. Gabon has a huge um, oil industry, a huge extractive industry. And um, I mean, that's one of the reasons that there was so much discontent with Bongo's government was corruption. Um, a third of the country are living in poverty despite those huge industries. Um, so it does seem like business as usual, and it does seem like the CTRI is kind of preserving those business interests. And I guess finally then, um, sanctions. Um, have there been sanctions imposed? Um, and what could be the effects should this be drawn out and the sanctions remain? So um, there haven't been sanctions imposed so far, um, but the longer that the transitional government prolongs the transition to civilian rule, um, the more likely it is that we're going to see um, countries and regional bodies impose sanctions. Um, the Economic Community of Central African States is meeting later today to discuss their response, so it's possible that they could impose sanctions. Um, but I do think it's worth highlighting that uh, that there is a risk that the US and France and those international governments will impose sanctions, but Bongo wasn't, um, you know, he was corrupt, his government was corrupt, um, 
and they have a lot of business interests there. I think it's more unlikely that they would impose the same kind of sanctions as we've seen on other countries in the region. Sure. So, um, so CMAC, the Economic and Monetary Community of Central African States, is, yeah. is that correct? That's it. They are, they are meeting today, 4th of uh, September. So by the time the podcast is out, they, we might have seen some sanctions imposed, potentially. We might. yeah. Um, so just to remind uh, friends and colleagues, clients, uh, listeners and viewers that um, to keep up to date on this, just, you know, do email us, ask us any questions you've got. Um, and, you know, certainly our desks will be reporting if there are impactive sanctions, right, going mm -hmm. forward? Absolutely. Great, good stuff. Well, um, no rest for the wicked. You remain, um, you remain very busy. Um, let's see if uh, the drumbeat of military coups continues uh, in West Africa. But for now, it's President Bongo that has seen uh, his government dissolved. Um, thank you very much, Edie, and uh, can't wait to get you on um, when there's another coup at some point, probably quite soon, right? Sounds good. <laughs> See you later, Edie. Thank you. Well, that's it for another edition of Sibline Insights. Uh, big thank you to Edie Lipton, uh, Karan Vasil from our Eurasia desk, and of course, Sydney Stewart, my co-host for today. Please remember to like and subscribe wherever you're getting uh, your podcast, and we look forward to welcoming you to the next edition.